This week on The Record, election year politics brings partisan power plays to the forefront in Jefferson City and Springfield. How Illinois Democrats flex their supermajorities to rewrite election laws and protect their own. And how Missouri Republicans tried to inject immigration fears into a fight over abortion and the state constitution, all swelling in a record 50-hour filibuster marathon. Plus, the costly consequences of running out the clock, what got caught in the bottleneck. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. The Missouri Senate set a record this week, a 50-hour filibuster, bringing the upper chamber to a grinding halt. Democrats successfully blocked the GOP push to include unrelated language about non-citizens voting into a ballot question about how hard it should be to change the state constitution. All that maneuvering coming in an election year when Missouri voters could decide whether to legalize abortion, sports betting, raise the minimum wage, and guarantee paid sick leave. But the filibuster dysfunction carried some costly consequences with it. One idea to create new sustainable local revenue streams to pay for early childhood education got caught up in all the bottleneck. All other debate was shut down and the agenda was rather action-packed in that final week of session, or at least it was supposed to be. Charlie Cooksey with We Power is now on the record. You had hopes that maybe some expanded uh, early childhood education funding could have been created through the Senate. What, did, how optimistic were you that that was actually going to happen this week until the filibuster? Yeah, I was deeply optimistic. I mean, you never know what happens uh, with the legislative body, but uh, we were looking forward to the chance of that legislation passing and allowing us to activate uh, our boots on the ground in St. Louis to win some ballot measures to support early childhood. It's interesting to watch. It's a hot topic in the city of St. Louis. The Board of Aldermen had been yes. debating it recently, and you have to couple it with this state law just to make it happen. So there's a lot of work on your plate yes. these days. Some critics of this proposal say raising the sales tax by even just a half a percent is a regressive tax. What's the payoff? Why is it worth it? Yeah, so when we think about the return on investment for early childhood, for every dollar invested, you see up to a $16 return on investment. So while the vehicle is not ideal, we are not pro-regressive taxes, we are pro-investing in early childhood and seeing that early childhood is an investment in our region. So. Um, we would love for there to be another taxing mechanism in our region, but that just is not the case. And we see the fact that the true cost of care for early childhood is $20,000 per kid per seat per year. And a half cent sales tax increase uh, is a lot less expensive than uh, having low-income families bear the brunt of such a costly educational experience. I think some estimates suggest they could raise between the city and county uh, almost $100 million. Yeah, that, that has been our big goal for several annually? years. Annually? Annually. How, uh, many and students, how many young kids, students, toddlers could that provide care for? So right now there's about 90,000 children ages 0 through 5. We were hoping that as many of those children as possible were able to benefit from both of these sales taxes accruing or amounting to about $100 million. Uh, but in terms of the, the gap, even though there's 90,000 children, only about 40,000, a little over 40,000 of them have seats. And then when you think about quality and affordability, the number uh, drops down to about 5% of those seats that exist being quality and affordable. I buried the lead too. This yeah. could have been a ballot question for voters in St. Louis County. That is no longer the plan. Yeah. But you're hoping not to move this, this year. Not, th not yet. Yes. You're hoping to move this through in the city though still. Can you do that if you don't have this change in state law? Yeah, so we started with looking at the county and state law says that anytime a sales tax uh, increases one, it has to be divided and managed across all of the municipalities. Easier to manage uh, in one city than in 88 of them? Exactly, so we did not want to move forward in the county with all of those potential inefficiencies. We want as many of those dollars as possible to go straight to child care programs. So that is why we decided to sunset our efforts in the county. However, there's one municipality, St. Louis City, and so right now our only challenge slash opportunity is to find the right home since it's not the Children's Services Fund. So there is still a real opportunity in the city to uh, find the right home to make sure we maintain integrity to our mission and to work to get on the ballot this November. Sounds like the story is not quite done. We look forward to the future of this conversation. Charlie Cooksey, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Illinois Democrats rushed an election bill to Governor Pritzker's desk, now facing GOP scrutiny. The bill's sponsor joining us next. Earlier this year, we told you about rather lackluster interest in running for office. 
Illinois' primary produced very few new candidates, leaving many incumbents free to run unopposed. But there is an alternative. Illinois election law gives major political parties a second chance to appoint or slate someone to jump in after the primary. If that candidate can raise enough petition signatures, they can slide into that spot on the ballot, or at least they could until now. House Republicans were rushing to gather enough signatures to try and put former Edwardsville Police Chief Jay Keevan on the ballot to challenge House Democrat Katie Stewart. That's when Illinois Democrats flexed their supermajorities to ban the slating process altogether. If this maneuver survives a court challenge, it could block Keevan from the ballot and usher Stewart back into another term unopposed. Assistant Majority Leader Jay Hoffman wrote that bill. He joins us now on the record. Representative, always good to have you with us. You, the House, and the Senate rushed this thing to Governor Pritzker's desk in record time, it seemed. What was the rush? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't believe it was uh, record time. The procedure is that you can uh, amend a bill and you can pass it, and it had been read three times. And the, the, what is missed, I think, in some of the articles is that uh, you know two years ago, actually 44 people uh, were put on the ballot by not having to file their petitions and go through the primary process. And uh, two years before that, in 2020, there was only 15. And two years before that, uh, it was only five. So we've seen the uh, political party bosses uh, begin to circumvent the primary process. And this is not something that was rushed. We've been working on getting the language for this, as well as something that I think is, is uh, equally important and that's putting three advisory referendums on the ballot so that individuals statewide can uh, uh, can give us their opinion regarding the protection of election workers, regarding property tax relief, and regarding insurance covering uh, the procedure of in vitro fertilization. So that the, uh, the being able to have party bosses just put people on the ballot without going through the primary process that everybody else goes through was just part of this bill. You're never going to hear me advocate for fewer elections or less buy-in from voters, but I, I also hear Republicans complain that this was rigging the rules in the middle of the game. If you said you've been working on this for some time, why not say, okay, we're going to make this effective for the next, the following election? The petition gathering and the primary process and all that, as you know, was already underway. I've run for quite a few years, and I went through the process the right way each time. Uh, and uh, like I said, this is become really uh, an epidemic where uh, people, uh, for over 40 pe people were put on the ballot in just the House and the Senate uh, two years ago without having to face the voters in the primary. Well, they'd still have uh, to face them in the general. But you can still get on the ballot now. You can run as an independent candidate. You can get the necessary petitions. Uh, or uh, you could obviously run as a write-in. But uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is is you should have to face the voters in order to be your party's nominee on the November ballot. And that's what this bill did. Is it your view that the former sheriff, Jay Keevan, qualifies to be on the November ballot because his petition signatures were submitted before the governor signed this bill that says effective immediately? Well, first of all, the bill uh, really had nothing to do with any individual. Republicans and Democrats who weren't facing uh, uh, opposition uh, through the primary process that party bosses could have, in the backroom deal, put people on the ballot the way they've been able to do uh, so often in the past here in Illinois. Very few other states, if any other state, has this this process. I'm not going to opine on whether or not uh, he should be on the ballot. That's going to be left up to the, uh, I assume, the courts. Well, the State Board of Elections is proceeding in the fashion that they, they do qualify unless somebody objects and then the board can, you know, somebody can object to the court, as you said. But you, you drafted this bill. The courts might look to you and the things you said on floor debate to see, wait a minute, what were they trying to do here? Does the, does the slating process still exist up until the moment Governor Pritzker signed it, or is the process gone? Is there no longer a process by which Jay Keevan or anybody else appointed by their political party can be on this November's ballot? Well, first of all, I wasn't even aware of where anybody in the state was in the process of, of slating. Uh, when I did the bill, there was no debate. Uh, the Republicans uh, didn't ask any questions. They all voted present and left the floor. Uh, so they had decided not to engage in a debate for whatever reason. Um, and they voted they, they voted present and, and walked off the floor. So there isn't really any, uh, at least in the House. I, I think there was a debate in the Senate. Uh, uh, Senate President Harmon, I believe, was the, the sponsor of the bill. And I, I assume what will happen is the courts will then look to uh, that debate for legislative intent. 
there was there were there were questions asked, however, in the uh, the committee hearing, which we held uh, prior to the floor debate. There was a big hot button issue in southern Illinois a couple of years ago in the Clean Energy Jobs Act when Governor Pritzker wanted to phase out carbon uh, coal, a lot of labor jobs were concerned about this. Now, as you approach this deadline, there's this idea that uh, zero carbon or carbon neutral doesn't have to mean putting coal out of business, but rather just somehow sweeping up and gathering all of the hot gas, the carbon in the sky, and then burying it deep underground can be something of a solution. Are you concerned at all that that's not a safe process? And two, what's at stake if Illinois can expand this carbon capture technology? Right now we're in debates and, and I'm part of the, the discussion and the meetings with the environmental groups, the labor and industry to come up with a bill here in Illinois that would capture li literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are part of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in Washington for carbon capture and sequestration. Where you would actually, I believe, you're making reference to the Prairie State, um, Prairie State Power Plant, which is in uh, Southern Illinois. Uh, they have uh, a feed study that has been conducted by the University of Illinois that I believe would indicate that they would capture 95% of the carbon dioxide that they are emitting currently. And it would be done safely, and it would be done economically, and it would take, it would it actually allow them and allow Illinois to bring in some of the money that has been put uh, federally for the uh, carbon uh, capture and sequestration activities. All right. He's one of the uh, the southernmost Democrat in the Illinois House and uh, one of the top Democrats in the House. Representative Jay Hoppin, thanks for joining us. Good to, good to talk to you, Mark. A St. Louis County Republican rose to the top ranks in Jefferson City, becoming the Speaker of the House. Now he's running for Secretary of State after facing some scrutiny in Jefferson City. Dean Plocker joins us next. We traveled to Jefferson City on Wednesday as the Missouri Senate was filibustering and stretching into its third consecutive day. Weary senators yawning as they rotated in shifts to speak on the floor. They were trying to block a plan that the House had sent over. Earlier in the year, Senate Democrats did allow a vote on a clean proposal that would have asked voters, would you like to make it harder to change the Constitution at the ballot box? But they refused to allow a vote on the House plan, which included other language to outlaw non-citizen voting or foreign influence over elections. Those things are already illegal. That's where I met House Speaker Dean Plocker, just in the hallway outside his office. As we stand here today, Senate Democrats are on the floor filibustering, saying they don't want deceptive or redundant language on this ballot question. They're happy to let the ballot question go to the voters to see if the voters want to make it harder to change the Constitution. The House had that version and could have passed it, but instead passed back to the Senate yeah. the one that has them held up yes, now. Yes, we did. Knowing what you know now, would you rather have just passed the old version without this ballot candy in it? No, I wouldn't. We have 50 words to explain to the voter what they're going to vote on. And I think you need to put your best foot forward when you apply those 50 words to the ballot. Now, the Democrats call it ballot candy when we're trying to do something. We may call it ballot candy when they're trying to do something. It's part of the game. It's part of our laws, our Constitution. They say it's like tricking voters into things that already exist in state law or the Constitution. No, I think what's tricking voters is actually the billionaires from out of state coming in and influencing Missourians and not adequately explaining to the voter what they are trying to accomplish in the state of Missouri where they're not even residents. I think we need IP reform for the Constitution because our Constitution is a more sacred document and shouldn't be so frivolously changed like statutory law. Should you win your race for Secretary of State, uh, I wonder if uh, what your position would be on ERIC, that voter database system. Some red states that have dumped it have sure. had a harder time certifying dead voters, out-of-state voters, and it was easier for them when they had ERIC, some have said. Sure. Would you bring ERIC back? You know, I've talked to many clerks. I've traveled around the state and spoken to a lot of clerks. A lot of the clerks had, had a good things to say about Eric. I think it's very important to protect our voter rolls to make sure that people that are on the voter rolls are legal, able-bodied voters and not deceased individuals or non-citizens that are somehow on the voter rolls. I, I think Eric should be further explored. I wasn't part of that decision to remove Eric. I haven't heard bad things about Eric, but I haven't heard great things about Eric. But a solution does need to be found to make sure our voters, voter rolls are secure and safe. The, the one knock against it, if you'll call it that, is that the current Secretary of State felt 
Well, it sends out this notification to younger voters usually who haven't already registered, and it sort of nudges them to do so. He says, look, if they've opted not to register, that's on them, and the state shouldn't be tapping them on the shoulder to remind them. You know, I, I fervently believe in public service, and I, it's a calling and it's an honor to serve here in the House. And I believe it's an honor to vote. It's part of our right to vote. It's what people that went before us fought for. I don't see why someone wouldn't want to register and vote. If so you'd be okay with the state to, reminding them to do it? I don't mind the state yeah. reminding them to do it. I think it's a civic duty. I think it's a civic duty to serve on a jury duty. Um, I think people should, democracy's not free. I, I would, I would lack, like to believe that people want to serve our democracy, whether that be at the ballot, whether that be in the jury box, whether that be serving in office, or just being a good citizen. What do you make of the field of candidates running for Secretary of State in this Republican primary? Well, there's only one good candidate. Who's that? myself. Oh, they might have a different story to tell. I don't know about that. Uh, you've seen the field of candidates. Yes. Uh, you don't think any of them are qualified for the job? I haven't said that. There's one more qualified than all the others. I got you. Some of them uh, might want to raise issues about some of the investigations that you went through during this period. Let them raise anything they want. I can take it. You on. feel those days are behind you? Listen, I've seen the evil side of bureaucracy. They attacked me. They tried to throw me out of office. I overcame that because I, I fought back with the truth and I was fully exonerated. It has only furthered my desire to keep working and be the Secretary of State for the state of Missouri so our elections can be fair and transparent and honest and forthright. Other reporters were in the building covering all those procedures and, and processes. I understand them to be concluded, all but one. I don't know what you would say to this if you've been in contact at all with the FBI. There was some reporting they had interest. No, there was, there was the FBI were never here. It was all part of the ruse of the bureaucrats attacking me. So have, have you received confirmation no. from the FBI that you're not a target of an investigation? I, I, no, I haven't received. I am not a target of any other investigation the one, other than the one that I was just exonerated by. And that's the question I ask because voters may want to know how can we be confident if we elect oh, this guy I think they can be very confident in me being fair and transparent and honest and knowing that I took on the deep state and I beat them. Republicans in the House were part of the deep state? I think the bureaucrats here that are trying to run our government, trying to tell the elected representatives what to do, took me on and we won. I would love to know your perspective on this because you've achieved the rank of speaker in your eight years in the House. With the perspective you have now looking back, is there merit to this idea of reforming or changing the way term limits kind of streamlines people through this cattle shoot of power pursuits. It's kind of an apt description, a cattle shoot. You're, you're forced to learn things quickly and, and you have to adapt. And I'm grateful to be surrounded by some good colleagues that I have complete trust in and have developed some good friendships with that'll carry on forever. Um, and yeah, I, you know. Should listen, it change the term know, limits? I, I would let the voters decide on that again. I mean, the voters voted for term limits. We live by the rules and that, that's in the Constitution. I'm happy living within the Constitution. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great ride. I would also point out that in my nine years here, we have never spent less money the following year until we pass this budget this year. We are spending less money next year than we spent last year because we're fiscally responsible, all while passing the most his historic, um, helpful education reform package in our state's history, I hear probably that. since we passed public schools. So uh, this I, is a deep, deep win for our children, our teachers, our superintendents, and parent choice. I hear the early ring of a campaign theme there, but I, I'm told we're out of time. But well, Mr. Speaker, thanks for- Thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. And I look forward to the next two days. We hope to have all the candidates for Secretary of State on our program before that August 6th primary to hear their version. You can also find that extended interview up on KSDK.com. For more, we'll be back right after this. Let's get ready to rumble. That's what Donald Trump said when he confirmed the first debate with President Joe Biden in June next month. That's before the Republican National Convention and well before the Democratic National Convention. So let's check the record. This first debate between two presumptive nominees is the first of its kind in American history. Never before have we seen two major party candidates square off on TV before their respective parties officially nominated them at the convention. Of course, that first televised debate back in 1960 between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. Nixon appeared sweaty and clammy and stuttered and stammered. The quaffed Kennedy kept calm and collected and conveyed a more stable hand. Fast forward to now, well, we're likely to hear about the age of these two candidates, Trump and Biden. Both men have already set consecutive records 
as the oldest presidents ever elected. That's all of our time this week. We're back again next week. Until then, we're off the record.